a safe exit. A Catholic woman accused of blasphemy in Pakistan, whose life remained in danger, has left the country. We have reaction. Threat from Tehran. Iran's president issues an ominous warning over what might happen in his country if he does not receive a new nuclear deal. Asserting executive privilege. President Donald Trump reacts as House Democrats seek to hold the attorney general in contempt over the Russia report. And tender mercies. Pope Francis reflects on his trip to Bulgaria and North Macedonia with a special nod to Mother Teresa. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 8, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining me from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Asia Bibi, the Catholic woman who spent eight years on death row on blasphemy charges in Pakistan, has left that country and is now safe in Canada. That's according to Bibi's lawyer, who says the 53-year-old wife and mother has been reunited with family. Religious freedom advocates and top American diplomats are welcoming the announcement. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the State Department. Good news. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the United States wishes Asha Bibi and her family all the best after news she arrived in Canada, where she had been seeking asylum. Pompeo says the U.S. opposes blasphemy laws like the ones in Pakistan because it jeopardizes fundamental freedoms like religious liberty. After spending eight years on death row and months under government protection in Pakistan, Asha Bibi has arrived safely in Canada. Her lawyer confirms Bibi is with her family. An advisor to Pakistan's prime minister, whose government supports strict blasphemy laws, confirmed Bibi was released. Court has uh, given her the opportunity and released her as a um, free citizen. And uh, how come I can intervene and interfere? Wherever she wants to go, she can go. But some reports indicate her health is in delicate condition. Still, American and British officials say it's a welcomed update. British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, who met with Mike Pompeo in London today, tweeted, fantastic news that Asha Bibi appears to have left Pakistan safely. Hunt and Pompeo spoke about the plight of persecuted Christians and the challenges to religious freedom around the world. The 53-year-old Catholic was convicted of blasphemy in 2009 after a quarrel with a fellow farm worker about her faith, a sentence that carried the death penalty. Pakistan's Supreme Court overturned her conviction last year, but Bibi and her lawyer had not found a country willing to grant her asylum until now. Islamic hardliners have rioted over the case and threatened to kill her for supposedly speaking ill of Islam's prophet, Muhammad. In March of last year, Asha Bibi's husband spoke about his wife's sentence, saying the blasphemy law is frightening and dangerous for Christians. He says when there is a dispute over land or personal grudges, Muslims lay the blame by calling blasphemy. Bibi's case garnered attention around the world. Pope Francis met with her husband and daughter in 2015, calling then for her immediate release. Religious freedom advocates and State Department officials note many Pakistanis don't see native Christians as their own fellow citizens and equals. Instead, they're viewed as outsiders and they're often treated as second-class citizens. Pakistani's state religion is Islam and around 97% of the population is Muslim. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo showed his support for the Iraqi government yesterday with a secret trip to Baghdad. He has received intelligence Iran is threatening U.S. interests in the Middle East. President Trump issued an executive order today imposing new sanctions on Iran as tensions there escalate. Iran's president has threatened to resume uranium enrichment in the next 60 days without a new international nuclear deal. President Rouhani makes the announcement on the one-year anniversary of the United States pulling out of the treaty. Secretary of State Pompeo has deployed an aircraft carrier to target these sanctions are targeting Iran's steel, aluminum, copper and iron. At least five people are dead after the Taliban attacked a U.S.-based aid organization in Afghanistan. This large plume of smoke is from a strike on the offices of the charity Counterpart International in Kabul. 
The attack injured about two dozen people. Security forces battled the insurgents for nearly five hours. President Trump invokes executive privilege, claiming the right to block lawmakers from special counsel Robert Mueller's full report on the Russia investigation. The move escalates the battle between Congress and the president. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. The Mueller report has been released, but it has redactions, meaning certain portions are not available for the public to see. Democrats want to view the entire unredacted report along with additional information, but the White House is pushing back. President Trump claims executive privilege. It's an attempt to keep the uncensored Russia investigation report from the Democratic-controlled Judiciary Committee led by Congressman Jerry Nadler. Chairman Nadler is asking the Attorney General of the United States to break the law and commit a crime by releasing information that he knows he has no legal authority to have. The White House argues releasing the full report would break the law by unveiling confidential and sensitive government information. But the Democrats on Capitol Hill say the White House isn't being transparent. This decision represents a clear escalation in the Trump administration's blanket defiance of Congress constitutionally mandated duties. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler wants to hold Attorney General William Barr in contempt of Congress after he failed to release the entire Mueller report. This is information we are legally entitled to receive and we are constitutionally obligated to review. But the White House isn't budging. In a statement, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders writes, neither the White House nor Attorney General Barr will comply with Chairman Nadler's unlawful and reckless demands. Republicans have largely united behind the president. Senate Majority, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell yesterday declared case closed on Mueller's Russia probe. McConnell describes Democrats as grieving the result. Lauren. Mark, and the House Judiciary Committee is holding the Attorney General in contempt of Congress, we've learned, and that's going to escalate the fight between President Trump and House Democrats. White House correspondent Mark Irons, thank you, Mark. Year after year, Congress battles over immigration. And year after year, year, no deal. For months now, presidential advisor and son-in-law Jared Kushner has been hashing out his own plan, as we reported yesterday. This week, he has unveiled those rough ideas to Republican senators, and Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi has their reaction today. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Several Republican senators inside that meeting are praising the plan. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas says there was a good deal of agreement amongst all of the senators inside that meeting. And Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota says it's a good starting point. He predicted Democrats could also get on board. Senator Lindsey Graham missed yesterday's White House meeting, but he sees promise. I haven't been briefed in detail, but I like the idea we're united behind a border security plan, merit-based immigration. Clearly, you got to work with Democrats to make it law. Years of dreams of striking an immigration deal, nothing has worked. Last year, the emotion is not agreed to. The Senate shot down. The motion is not agreed to. One immigration plan after another. The motion is not agreed to. Four in all, failing. The motion is not agreed to. So how is this time going to be any different? Kushner started meeting in January with key conservatives and leaders from business and other groups, and he's propelled by the success of working to pass last year's criminal justice reform. I want to thank my daughter Ivanka, my son-in-law Jared Kushner. I want to thank... This time, the White House hasn't worked with Democrats. Kushner may be looking for a plan Republicans can rally around, a way to make clear what the party is for, as his father-in-law heads into the election. Opponents also see an opportunity. That I live on the U.S.-Mexico border, that a quarter of those with whom I live and that I represented in Congress were born in, in another country, that I can tell a, a very powerful, positive story uh, about what immigration means to the betterment of this country. Now Jared Kushner's immigration plan would move us to a merit-based system that puts preference on job skills over family immigration. It would also focus on border security at ports of entrance. But this issue, as we saw in that video, divides the Republican Party. And House Democrats, their attention really is diverted on investigating the president right now. That's Lauren? right. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. At least one person is dead and eight others are injured after a school shooting in Colorado. Police say they have two suspects in custody. The state's governor says violence has no place in schools. 
Schools should really be places where students can learn and grow, safe places, uh, and we shouldn't have to worry about being marched out or having being airlifted to hospitals or even losing one's life. The shooting took place not far from Columbine High School, where 12 students and one teacher were killed in 1999. In yesterday's shooting, police say both suspects attended the STEM School Highlands Ranch. One student is an 18-year-old male and the other a juvenile female. Coming up, a pro-life Democrat in an election battle tells us about the fight for the unborn. And why the Vatican is examining the roots of the word Pharisee. As we reported yesterday, a pro-life Democrat in Illinois is facing a tough primary challenge from a pro-abortion member of his own party. Representative Dan Lipinski has become a target of NARAL, Pro-Choice America, EMILY's List and Planned Parenthood. They're backing his opponent, Marie Newman, in a primary next March. Congressman Dan Lipinski joins us now from Capitol Hill. Welcome back to our broadcast, sir. It's good to be with you. You chair the pro-life caucus and are a staunch defender of life, which is making you a target in this election. How do you handle that? Well, first of all, I, I'm pro-life because I believe that we need to defend the most vulnerable. And in our society today, the most vulnerable are the unborn. Uh, the Democratic Party is supposed to be about protecting the vulnerable. So I see it perfectly in fitting with the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, there are very few pro-life Democrats, only a couple of us left uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, even though there's 30 percent of uh, Democrats nationwide, Democratic voters, say that they are pro-life. There are some Democrats really pushing for a much more liberal and progressive party. Is that where the party is going? Will there be, will there continue to be any place for a pro-life Democrat politician? Well, I'm going to keep fighting to, uh, to stay here. I think it's important for the pro-life movement to be in the Democratic Party, not just in the, in the Republican Party. And so I'm going to keep, keep fighting to uh, stick in here. And as I said, 30 percent of Democratic voters nationwide say that they are pro-life. So there needs to be room in the Democratic Party uh, for people, for voters who are pro-life. We need to have elected representatives who are pro-life. What advice do you have for practicing Catholics who are Democrat? Is there room for them in this party? Well, I think the most important thing for practicing, Dem practicing Catholics uh, in terms of the Democratic Party is to be, first of all, we need to be Catholic first. I spoke at uh, Ave Maria University uh, this, this past weekend. And uh, what I talked to the graduates about was the importance of in this very partisan society that they need to be Catholic first, Catholic in all they do. Don't fall for, you know, falling in with the, everything the party believes. Uh, most important is to, to be Catholic. So that's what I think is, is the most important thing for uh, all Catholics to be thinking about and acting on. You're the only House Democrat who did not sponsor the Equality Act, its legislation forbidding discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. What is your concern about that bill? Well, my number one concern is that it says that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act will not apply uh, to anything in this bill. Uh, that's my, my greatest concern. Uh, we're going to see what happens. It's, uh, this is really going to be more of a symbolic vote. Uh, the bill is not going to go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, I understand the, uh, what the supporters want to do with this bill. It's important that all Americans are protected, not discriminated against. Uh, but I'm going to continue to push as, as things go forward to make sure that our religious freedom is protected uh, in this legislation. So that is what, uh, you know, that's why I did not co-sponsored. I'm the only Democrat who did not co-sponsor it in the House of Representatives, but, you know, that's the reason. Lone wolf there, Democratic Congressman Dan Lipinski. Thank you so much, co-chair of the Pro-Life Caucus. Thank you. A group at the Vatican dedicated to studying the Bible is reconsidering whether the Christian understanding of Pharisees as hypocrites is accurate. 
The Pontifical Biblical Institute is sponsoring an international conference on this topic. Religious experts from all over the world are discussing the history of Jesus and the Pharisees. This study comes as the Institute celebrates its 110th anniversary. Rabbi David Rosen of the American Jewish Committee and a veteran of Catholic Jewish dialogue, especially with popes, joins us from Rome. Rabbi, you delivered opening remarks at this conference. What was your message? What should Catholics know about the ancient figure of the Pharisee? Well, um, my opening remarks were that we need to both use scholarly research and contemporary understanding in order to advance not only our grasp of the historical context in which Jesus lived, but in also, also to avoid misunderstandings and misbehavior towards one another in contemporary society. And the irony is that because Christianity at a certain point, or should I say the Jesus movement, detached itself from its Jewish roots, so it no longer started to look at the New Testament texts as internal debates within the Jewish community, but sought to portray those, if you like, as opposed to Jesus outside the community or outside their community. And the word Pharisee, instead of referring to a particular community where there were Sadducees and Essenes and different Herodians or different groups referred to, in which there were, if you like, good guys and not so good guys, became identified as a, another word for bad guys. Now, because a Jewish tradition saw itself as coming out of the Pharisaic tradition, Therefore, the term Jews and Pharisee became interchanged, and therefore, when the word is used pejoratively in a negative sense to mean rigid, legal, nasty people, that is actually being directed to the Jewish community and therefore is a source of anti-Jewish prejudice. What grade would you give the Catholic Church in recent years when it comes to Catholic-Jewish dialogue? So we live in a golden age of Catholic-Jewish dialogue. The revolution, we must give copyright to John XXIII, who of course ushered in the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. And in 1965, the document Nostra Aetate was promulgated, which revolutionized the whole approach of the church towards Jews, Judaism, and also to Israel eventually. So that state, Nostra Aetate, amongst other things in section four, affirms that God does not repent of his gifts, that the covenant with God and the Jewish people is eternal. It condemns anti-Semitism and repudiates the idea that the Jewish people has been rejected by God and replaced by the church. Coming out of that emerges an approach in which we are seen as partners. In fact, Pope Francis today talks of the complementarity of our relationship. So it's really a golden era. Each pope has moved one stage further in deepening the bonds between the church and the Jewish people. But this doesn't mean that there aren't residual prejudices. You can't have 2,000 years, if you like, of mutual alienation just disappear in 50. It takes a lot of work and a lot of education. Sure. And even people who do love the mm -hmm. Jewish people profoundly, like Pope Francis himself, may even unconsciously use a generalization like talking about the Jews or the Pharisees in a generalized way. What we would like him to do is to say those Pharisees or those Jews. Of course, nobody thinks that the Pope himself has any prejudicial negative attitudes. The problem is not so much the Pope. The problem is some piece priest in Bogota, for example, who would say, well, the Pope talks like that about the Jews and the Pharisees. Why shouldn't I? Thank you so much for joining us for your insights onto Catholic Jewish relations. Rabbi David Rosen of the American Jewish Committee. Thank you, Lauren. Up next, Pope Francis tells the faithful about his trip to Bulgaria and North Macedonia. Plus, the Catholic perspective on vaccinations. U.S. health officials say 764 cases of measles have been reported this year, the highest number in 25 years. And right now, some states, in some states, there's a religious or moral exemption rule for parents who want to opt out of vaccinating their children. But as the number of cases continue to climb, some states are considering ending this exemption. Religious exemptions focus on the source of the vaccines, which can be developed from animal cells and aborted fetal tissue. In 2005, the Vatican said it is permissible to use these vaccines if no other alternatives are available. Dr. Barbara Golder joins us now. She is the editor-in-chief of the Linacre Quarterly. That's the official journal of the Catholic Medical Association. Welcome to our broadcast. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me, Lauren. The Pontifical Academy for Life at the Vatican concluded that it is not only permissible, but morally responsible for Catholics to get vaccinated. Can you help our, under view our viewers understand that? Sure. I, I think there are two pieces to this. One is the objection to the vaccine because it comes from a cell line that was derived from aborted fetuses. And part of the problem in the United States is there's no alternative to that. Every vaccine that we use uh, for MMR particularly comes from a, a cell line that came from And MMR fetuses. is measles, is that right? Measles, the measles vaccine. Measles vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the problem is that we don't have a choice here in the United States. But in addition to that, they looked at the proximity of, of that abortion to today and to the event of making uh, the vaccine and decided that there's just not a close enough connection to provide a moral uh, objection to using those vaccines, particularly in light of the fact that measles is a, 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 an epidemic disease. It really does cause some serious complications and, and, and problems, and we have no alternative. And so the Pontifical well, Academy said it's okay to use it. Well, what do you say, Dr. Barbara Golder? What do you say to Catholics who, despite that ruling, are really conflicted about getting the vaccine? I, I think the church always says you follow your conscience. And there, there are people for whom this is a conscience issue in spite of what the, the, the Pontifical Academy has said, because the Pontifical Academy also said it promotes an unjust choice between choosing the vaccine or, or choosing to, to be able to, to be vulnerable to measles. Well, so I think that we, all, we always get to follow our conscience, but you can't say that the church compels you to in this place. Contracting measles is really serious, but since it's now so rare or has been, people have sort of forgotten how dangerous it is. So my question to you, do parents have a moral responsibility to society to help protect those who are particularly vulnerable, like the elderly and infants? I think they do, and that's one of the issues that the Pontifical Academy raised in, in, the, in the article, that, that we have a responsibility to the general health and to avoid circumstances where our decisions adversely impact someone else. And for the elderly, for, for small children, for people with immune compromise, for cancer patients, they have no way of avoiding this because measles is so very contagious and it's contagious before we know we have it. And it's contagious long after you've been in the, in the place uh, where you might contract it. It's, it. It can survive for long times on surfaces and counters and things like that. So it's, it's possible to con convey measles without knowing you have it in the first place. Dr. Barbara Golder, Editor-in-Chief of the Linacre Quarterly, the official journal of the Catholic Medical Association. We have to leave it there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Pope Francis says his trip yesterday to North Macedonia, the homeland of Mother Teresa, was a reminder of the tenderness her religious order showed to the poor. Sono rimasto colpito della tenerezza, della tenerezza evangelica di queste donne. During his weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father said the missionaries of charity should be examples to all of us, especially because they, quote, dream big, get involved, and listen to the voice of God. The Holy Father also reflected on his trip to Bulgaria, saying he was reminded of St. John the 23rd, who spent roughly a decade there. Finally tonight, The Francis Effect and EWTN helped a woman come home to the Catholic Church. Gertrude is from Germany and met Pope Francis today. She says she owes her return to the church to EWTN and Mother Angelica. And her friend Irene on the left flew with Gertrude to Rome. And Gertrude says that Pope Francis asked her to pray for him a lot. Gertrude's friend Irene is the wife of Martin Rottweiler, our colleague at EWTN Germany. For all of us here at EWTN News, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and at Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. We leave you tonight with more images from the Pope's meeting with pilgrims today at the Vatican. Good night and God bless you.